Good evening, folks, and welcome to the long overdue episode 5. In this episode, I thought I'd pick up where I left off in the last episode, Host Encounters. Uh, at the end of that episode, I talked about how I don't do field, field research because the idea of running into one of these things in the forest literally terrifies me. And I believe I touched on it when I said it terrifies me because the when I was face to face with that one, when I was 13 years old, I could see the intelligence in the thing. You could see it in its eyes. And the idea of running into one out in the forest, I mean, it's not the same as, run, I mean, I wouldn't want to run into a cougar either. But if I did, I could probably scare the thing off. You know, I mean, a cougar, you get, unless he gets the jump on you, you can pretty much just scare them off. You know, I mean, they're either going to run away or they're going to try to kill you and eat you. But uh, there, there's actions you can take to deal with the situation. I don't think there is an action you can take with a Bigfoot to deal with the situation, not if it's one of the ones that's intent on eating you or killing you. If he wants to kill you and he wants to eat you, you're, you're, you're probably done for. And that's why I don't, I, I just, it terrifies me, the whole idea of running into them because they, they have guile, they're unpredictable. You know, I mean, a regular predator or any other animal out there that you run into um, it's fight or flight. Well, it's eat or flight, really. They're, they're either going to eat you or they're going to run away because they're scared of you. A Bigfoot's not the same. I mean, you can, uh, he's going to think about whether he wants to run away or not. He's going to, you know, if he's in a bad mood, cause then him and the old lady aren't getting along. He might, he might want to eat your ass or, ki- or just bust you up real good, you know, uh, kill you. So anyway, I wanted to to use this episode to to illustrate my point. So I'll start off by just just briefly talking about a couple of stories I heard recently. One of them I heard on Outlaw, uh, Bigfoot Outlaw Radio. And Bear was talking about a situation or an incident that happened in Daniel Boone National Forest where a man was brutally murdered by two or three Bigfoot and evidently he was out there trying to uh, zero in his brand new rifle before he goes hunting and uh, a Bigfoot had appeared out there by where his targets were and he shot it and he went to finish it off or whatever or see what it was uh, or whatever he was doing they don't know nobody was there they just uh, uh, retraced his steps and found blood and stuff like that. So they figure this is what he did. And then uh, a couple other of the Bigfoots, the one he shot, a couple of his friends came along and and uh, pummeled the guy, killed him. They literally, you know, twisted him up like a pretzel, 
drug him back to his truck and put him in the truck. Now, <clears throat> what bothers me about that is they put him back in his truck. That means that they were watching him. They knew that he was in the truck. Well, actually, I, you can't even make that assumption. But what you can, but the assumption you can make is that they knew that the man got there in that truck. A much worse uh, assumption is that they knew that because they've been watching other people and they know that people are in trucks. That's actually worse than if they had just seen him get there in the truck. Because that means, and this is something that's talked about in in uh, on other podcasts and and by other researchers all over, is that you know um, there is a um, an observed behavior of Bigfoot's watching people, and I'm going to uh, play a little snippet from a radio show it was i think it's might be coast to coast or something i don't really know because it was a youtube video which was a rebroadcast you know how that works yeah, but it's called uh dark side of sasquatch is what the show was called and it has uh um, bear from uh bigfoot outlaw radio is who he was interviewing so here i'm going to play a little clip of what bears now bears in case you don't know He's been uh, researching Sasquatch for four, 40 years. When he was a kid, I guess they had a, a pack of them that lived on their property. So he was very, I mean, and he'd had run-ins with them since he was just a little kid. So he's quite uh, quite familiar with Bigfoot. So uh, I'm going to play a little snippet of, of what his observations or what he, he has to say about this. I believe it's very highly intelligent. It's watched us for centuries. I mean, something has caused this thing to not trust man. I mean, and who can blame it? I mean, here, its habitat is taken away by man. It sits there and watch uh, us go out there and hunt other game. Uh, it is in its a uh, benefit to sit there and study us to a large degree. If this thing realized that, you know, we was putty in its hands like we actually are, we would be in trouble. That would make it a total apex type creature. See, and there's the problem. The intelligence I saw in the thing's eyes makes me wonder if that's not why they're not watching us. Because they're starting to get that to the level of intelligence where they're realizing that we are putty in their hands, but they're not quite sure yet. They quite, haven't quite hit that point yet. Now here's another little uh, little snippet along those same, same lines. Uh, if these things realized that we did not have nothing on their abilities, their strength or their size, uh, we would be in a very bad shape. Uh, just think, nobody could ever go back out into the outdoors or anything if these things realized that uh, they had it over on us. Makes sense. And I think that, uh, by and large, that the majority of the Bigfoot population has not come to the realization that they do have us by the short hairs and they could do whatever they wanted with us. But there are instances where it seems like that is uh, not the case with all of them. Uh, there was a story that I had read here recently on uh, Sasquatch Chronicles uh, um, blog. And here I've actually pre-recorded me reading that. Sasquatch Chronicles blog, July 23rd. The creature chased our car. A guy and his girlfriend were driving down this mountain road. Something was running diagonally through a field toward their car on two legs. The male driver slowed almost to a stop, thinking it was maybe someone in need or something. 
It being dark, he couldn't tell it wasn't a person until I got right up to the car. He said when it was 25 to 30 yards away, he realized it was way too big and moving way too fast to be a person. He dropped it in gear and punched it. Now here's the kicker. They had rolled their windows down as they stopped to get a better look or listen for someone yelling for them. 30 yards away, uh, when he floored his four-wheel drive to leave and before he could get up to speed to get away, the creature had already made it to the vehicle and it stuck its arm inside and started to grab his girlfriend's arm. These are people that didn't believe in Bigfoot until this night. He was just getting up to speed when it reached in and put its hand on his girlfriend's arm. Right at this point, he finally got enough speed up to get away. He said he wasn't sure if it chased them because his girlfriend was so hysterical, he only looked back in his rearview mirror once, and it was so dark he couldn't tell if it was coming or not. Do you think this was a territorial display, or do you think it really meant to yank her out, out of the car? Okay. Now, some of the people on this on the, that commented on this blog post... Or saying things like, it was just a display, it was mad, it was a counting coup, which I guess means screwing with them. Um, and then a couple of them said they thought it was meant to take the girl out of the car. Now, I gotta tell you, the Sasquatch runs up to the car while they're driving down the road, and it's just trying to scare them. He hit the gas and started leaving as the Sasquatch approached the vehicle. The Sasquatch at that point would have accomplished his mission of scaring them off. There was no reason for him to reach in the window and grab at the girl. I mean, come on. It was trying to get the girl out of the car. And this isn't the first instance of this happening. There have been other situations where I can't remember what which... Uh, where I heard it was on Sasquatch Chronicles or a Bigfoot report. But there was a, a woman driving down the road and a Sasquatch ran up and grabbed, tried to grab her little girl out of the car or the truck. I forget what it was. Um, there are multiple instances of Bigfoots going up to little girl's windows and tapping on the window. And, um, actually there was one, I just, uh, a story I just heard on, I think it was pack West's, uh, YouTube channel where, uh, this woman was freaked out because her little girl had told her that, uh, was a big hairy man or something had been at their window at night. And when she went in there one night to see if they were telling the truth, yeah, Sasquatch was at the window. But the Sasquatch had been tapping on the window and whistling at the little girls and stuff, trying to get them to go to the window. Now, this is a familiar story. I'm sure any of you who have been paying attention to and uh, listening to and reading uh, Bigfoot reports know what I'm talking about. This is not a new thing. Sasquatches seem to be um, always at kids' windows trying to get them to open the window. So to say it's counting coup or messing with them or trying to scare them away, don't really think so. I think the thing meant to grab the chick out of the car. So I, I it, it's kind of uh, a little annoying to me that and, and I think it comes back to people wanting Sasquatch to be kind and gentle creatures. So they'll say things like, well, every now and then there's a rare situation where there's a, a, a mean Bigfoot. I do believe that Bigfoots have different um, um, temperaments, just like people. I believe that is true. But I also believe that it's a larger percentage of them that's going to try and grab people and eat them and kill them and things like that. I think there's a larger percentage than what the... Uh, Bigfoot community at large wants to believe. I kind of got off on a tangent there, but the point was that the Bigfoot charged the car. And now there's two people in the car. This Bigfoot's by itself and they're in a car. 
<clears throat> now, some of the people in there just speculated that perhaps the sound of the car, maybe because it was an old four-wheel drive truck or something, maybe that um, got the uh, Bigfoot angry, and that's why he charged the car. Well, it still doesn't explain why he was reaching in the window to try and grab the girl out of the car. And I absolutely believe that's exactly what he was doing. He wanted to get that girl out of the car. Um, <clears throat> now, along those same lines, and one of the things I was just getting at, let me let me uh, play another snippet from that same uh, broadcast. It was good stuff, or a uh, good interview with Bear. But he brought up another point. Now, I've spent the last couple of days putting this show together, and I ran across this show earlier today. And there was so much stuff that was applicable to what I intended this show to be about anyway, that it was just gold. So let me let me go ahead and play this other snippet, this other piece, this other clip of of Bear talking about this. In Thackerville, Oklahoma, at a place called Brown Springs, there was this gentleman and his girlfriend was on a date out of Texas. Thirty five highway shoots straight north across the Red River. Uh, from Texas to Oklahoma, and a lot of there's a place just across the river at uh, the Red River called Brown Springs at Thackerville, Oklahoma. The story come from a <clears throat> newspaper reporter at the time. He's retired now, named Butch Bridges. And what had happened was he kept his uh, police scanner on at all times, and he got a very strange report one night. And what it was, there was two bodies found at this location considered and called Brown Springs, Oklahoma. Actually, people can look this up on the Internet. There's not a lot of information, but the story is there. Uh, what had happened was this young man and this woman had went to this location, and they had spread a, a blanket on top of the hood of this young man's car. And during the act of things getting frisky and everything, uh, something had walked up behind them. The young gentleman was uh, basically on top of the young girl, but whatever walked up behind him grabbed him by his head and twisted his neck all the way around. Uh, and when they found the body lying in the reeds next to the actual spring itself, he, he, he was looking totally opposite the way he's supposed to be. It had twisted his, his neck all the way around, looking completely across his back. And Oof. whatever grabbed him just wrenched his head all the way around off his shoulders and threw the body over there into the reeds. Well, then the young girl was found on the hood of the vehicle, ripped open from stem to stern, had bruises and bruising between her thighs which that shows uh, she was alive during this actual sexual assault. Because once oh. your heart quits beating, right. you cannot bruise. You, you, you see where I'm coming from? And yep. her eyes were wi wide open. Uh, rigor mortis had set in, and her mouth was in a wide open scream type position. Saliva was everywhere across her face and her mouth and everything. They had all kind of state troopers and all in there, investigators, detectives, private eyes, the whole nine yards, closed off the area. Brooke Butch had access to the area due to his press credentials, so forth and so on. Uh, I did not believe, you know, I just thought this was probably a fable or, you know, somebody just telling this story. But on one of our Bigfoot outings that we had in 2007, uh, we had a uh, police lieutenant from um, North Dakota drove all the well. He flew down here. I picked him up at Memphis Airport, and we took him on a Bigfoot expedition in Alabama. And he was very interested in this story. And I told him, I said, "Would you please, since you have access to these files, you know, there, there's, I, I don't know what it's called." But only unsolved cases, only police and law enforcement agencies can look this up or call in about it. On cold and cases? That's it. Okay. Well, he went back home, and due to his credentials, 
he was able to find the case file, find everything, and he verified this to me. He said this has really happened and it's still considered an unsolved murder. Uh, homicide, rape, everything, the whole nine yards. Now, obviously, this was a, a teenage boy and a teenage girl who went off in the woods somewhere to have sex. So this Bigfoot decided that he was going to help himself to this guy's girl because he wanted to get him some. So this big, Bigfoot goes up. Now, this is two to one. There's one Bigfoot. Uh, you can assume it's one Bigfoot. You know, one Bigfoot attacks these two people um, on their car. Now, an animal, if he was, if, if, if this was, we were just dealing with a dumb animal that just has predatory instincts, that animal would have already learned to stay away from cars. If, if it knew what a car was, it would know to stay away from cars or skirt. Cars would have be some, some source of, strike some source of fear in the, in the animal. Um, and this is not the case with this Bigfoot. So this Bigfoot comes up to this car. Now the Bigfoot knew that, well, it knew the people were there. They were probably having sex. He could hear them. But he went up to this car, which first of all should have been intimidating, and it wasn't, to two people, two against one, which should have been intimidating, and it wasn't. Why? Because that Bigfoot knew that it had them. Now, you could say, well, it, it, it was because they were having sex and they were preoccupied. It knew it would sneak up on them, blah, blah, blah. It had it caught them by surprise. I don't think that's the case. I think this particular Bigfoot, like many others, knew that it could easily dispatch the boy and have its way with the girl. And having its way with our women seems to be a common theme with Bigfoots. And they don't seem to be too, uh, they don't seem to care about the age of the girl. Which is kind of understandable if they don't really understand the ages and all that stuff. However, you're talking size. You know, not only are we much smaller and our females are much smaller than our males... But they don't care the age of the female. They're, I mean, all the way down to a, a young girl, um, which would be very small. All they care about is getting some. Now listen to uh, what Bear has to say about that one there. All they had to do is look back on it and go to various uh, Bigfoot websites on the Internet and see that these things are looking in bedroom windows. Well, if you go a little farther and look at it, the bedroom windows, uh, probably around 75% of the time, are of single, young females. And these things, I mean, when you you live in a troop-like or clan-like situation, and the troop is dominated by an alpha male, and he's the only one having all the sexual fun because he don't want, and I mean, him being the alpha, he dominates. So he determines when and who he has sex with amongst the females. All these other young males are standing around there sexually frustrated. So if the scent gets into the air and they smell, say, a female uh, maybe coming into her season as a young lady, that's why you have most of these sightings that uh, are reported where they look in bedroom windows, and normally it's in bedroom windows of uh, young ladies anywhere from the age of 11, 12, 13, 14 years of age. Now, in my, uh, my Bigfoot encounter eye-to-eye -eye with a Sasquatch, when the Sasquatch was looking in the kitchen window at us, it was staring at my cousin Teresa, who at the time was 12 years old. I mean, and... She was only maybe, uh, let's see, 12 years old. She's probably 5'4", five, 5'5", five, five, not even 5'4", you know? I mean, she was small. She was probably 5' foot even at 12 years old. I don't think she got over, well, no, I think she was 5'7 when she got older. But, um, yeah, she was only maybe 5' foot tall. So she was small, very, very, uh, you know, as, in comparison to a Bigfoot, you know, our uh, adolescent females are very diminutive and yet they are completely enthralled and sexually 
uh, sexually uh, attracted to them. They're, they 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 go after them. And here's a uh, report, the big BFRO report that I ran across that kind of uh, speaks to this point. It's also pre-recorded. BFRO report number 29055, Class A, submitted by a witness on Thursday, March 31st, 2011. Young girl recounts two encounters at the family farm near Chehalis. I lived in Chehalis, Washington on Sen Road across from Warehouserland. I had two close contact experiences as a child there. The first one happened when I was 11. My grandparents were visiting and had their camper parked next to our house. And here's a follow-up investigation by BRFO investigator Scott Taylor. She, the first encounter. She was alone in the living room playing piano. The piano was arranged so that if sitting to play, your back is facing a large picture window. Her parents were in their bedroom. Her siblings were with their grandparents in the camper playing cards. She said that she was playing away and then got that I'm being watched feeling. She turned around to see a Sasquatch looking through the window at her. Her reaction was to just stare at it in shock for a moment, frozen with fear. Then when she recovered, her, when she, recovered she screamed. She remembers the creature making a sort of raised eyebrow facial reaction in surprise in response to her scream. It then turned and ran off as her father came into the room. Her father saw its back as it ran away. It ran by the camper and her grandparents and siblings also saw it run by. It ran upright on two legs. She said that it had to run around or jump over the farm equipment and other items until it got to the pasture. It ran with a very heavy gait, supporting lots of weight. Once it was at the pasture, it really got going fast as it ran away. Creature Description She said that when she first turned and looked at it, it was standing on the ground, leaning forward, supporting itself with its two hands placed on the outside wall above the window. It was leaning forward with its head under the eaves of the house so that it could see her through the window. She described the, pe the creature as having very long arms. The hair was reddish brown. It appeared to be three to four inches long overall, but longer on the shoulders and head. There was a hint of ears, but hair was covering them. There was not much hair under its arms, and the hair was a lighter color in this region. There was hair all over the face and was not of uniform color, shaded light to dark. It was obviously male. It had wide shoulders. There was good definition over the waist and hips. From shoulders to waist, it was V-shaped. She was impressed by how muscular and cut it looked. She explained that physicality, in retrospect, the Bigfoot's appearance was very impressive. It did not look aggressive and appeared to be shocked when she turned around and screamed. The head was longer than a human's head by proportion. It was wide at the forehead and rectangular in shape with a wide jaw. The mouth was pronounced and a little ape-like. It was very hairy around the mouth. She did not see teeth. The top of the head was somewhat pointed toward the back. The eyes were a honey color or a brown copper color. She saw no white in the eyes. The eyebrows scrunched as it looked at her in surprise when she screamed. The face looked intelligent. The nose seemed like it was flatter than a human. Second encounter. It came back next summer. She believes it was very. It was the very same creature. The house had no air conditioning and it was hot, so she would put a mattress in the back of the truck and make that into her summer bedroom. She and her friend were sleeping in the back of the father's truck when something caused them to awaken. What they saw was the creature looking in the side window at them. They were both awake but frozen with fear. They held on to each other. It stood there looking at them, for 20 to 30 minutes, while the two girls did not move a muscle. She said that they were both in pain from being immobile for so long. Then the creature moved towards the open tailgate of the truck. She was afraid of what it would do and nearly passed out with fear, but, never sh but it never showed itself there as it moved off and left. As a young girl, she used to spend most of her free time playing along the creek and roaming around the woods. She would collect agates from the creek to sell the sell them to the rock collectors every summer at the gem show in town. 
She used that to make some money and became very good at grading the stones, knowing what they were worth and what gem collectors were looking for. As such, she probably became a familiar person to any Sasquatch living in the area, and as a female child, would be an object of their curiosity and not a threat. Her brother and sister also played outdoors. This behavior on their part is exactly what would make a Sasquatch interested in, in observing them. Also, the playing of music is an often reported activity that seems to interest Sasquatches. This combination of being a female child, playing in and roaming the woods, as well as playing piano, is a powerful enticement to the local Sasquatches. So girls, noise, music brings Bigfoot in. I guess that's why Bobo was always coming up with like fireworks and rave music and oh, the Girl Scouts out in the field. Actually, I think uh, they should have done something like uh, the. I ran across a video today when I was looking for uh, for music to close the show with, and I always go with something that has a lot of energy, some percussion or some uh, electric guitar or something like that. I ran across this video. It's kind of like uh, instead of dueling banjos, it was dueling drummers. Now, if anything's going to bring the Bigfoot in, this would. This is two different drummers. I'm going to play the first one here. That was Kanadi Sato from Japan. Eight years old, number two female drummer in the world. That's right, eight years old, and she's the number two female drummer in the world. Well, actually, she was eight years old when she did that. She's 13 now. And here's another one. was 13-year-old Senri Kamaguchi, number one female drummist, drummer in the world. Now, I'll tell you what, get those two girls out there in the, in the woods playing the drums like that, and uh, if that's not going to bring Big, Bigfoot coming, I don't know what will. I mean, first of all, the noise, the music of the drums, and they're in that age group, so... That's, that's like the trifecta right there. However, we couldn't really do that because if we knew that that would bring a Sasquatch coming, I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't feel right putting those girls in there, using them as bait like that. I mean, more than likely they'd end up uh, a meal. I don't care how many guys with guns you had around there. And that's one area where I could, uh, I really uh, had a problem with finding Bigfoot is when they had those Girl Scouts out there in the woods. I mean, it's it would be impossible for them to keep those girls safe. I heard a story here recently, and I wish I, wish I could remember exactly where I heard it from, but it was uh, a group of hunters went to some remote lake to go, to go hunting, and they had to get flown out there with a, uh, what do you call them, a pontoon plane, a seaplane, whatever. And uh, when they were flying out there, they saw a Bigfoot walking through the field. And they didn't really, it didn't register with them, but it was walking towards the area where they were going to camp. And they landed, and some of you have probably heard this story. Uh, they landed, they let the guys off, and the, the pilot was going to come back, I don't know, three or four days later, whatever it was, pick them up and take them back. They were going hunting. Now, they had some pretty serious weapons. Oh, I know where I heard this story. This is uh, um, Kunbo. From Bigfoot Outlaw Radio, he was talking about this. 
And uh, when the pilot came back, well, he found just two of the hunters, two of the four, dead. The camp was demolished. There was like, uh, I think he said it was 30 or 40 uh, shell casings laying all over the place with some high-powered rifles, rifles that would take down an elephant. Um, 30, 40 casings all over the place, big footprints, and uh, these guys were killed. Now, high-powered rifles. You got a bunch of Girl Scouts out in the woods using them as bait for Bigfoot. And I'm sure Bobo's heard this story. Why would you do that? You're just, you're, you, I mean, <clears throat> now, <clears throat> I don't think there were more than a handful of those girls that were, that were around the age where they were going through that change. Um, so that might have been what kept them safe. But had they had some, if Bigfoot come out there and he was one of these, uh, and I, I suspect that it's actually the, uh, the younger males who are guilty of this more so than the older males. I think the older males, just like a married guy, they're not out there catting around. But the younger males who are uh, wandering by themselves or maybe even you know a couple of younger males, because I've heard stories of um, groups of young males um, um, moving around together. Um, in any case, younger males who are out on their own, they've been kicked out by the... Uh, the group they grew up with and now they're out on their own. They're, they're looking for a female to mate with. Now, if one of those had come out there and some of those girl scouts were of age, you know, um, I don't think there was, I, I think no matter how, how many guys with guns you had out there, if they had any, I think that that Bigfoot would slaughter everybody in order to get to those girls. Um, and that's where I, I, I had a problem with that immediately when I watched that show. And I don't think anyone should be using young girls for bait like that. Um, <clears throat> now I kind of got off. I, th I keep going off on tangents. I'm trying to bring the show back to what I was originally talking about. And that's why it terrifies me. Um, the idea of running into one out there. Um, even though I've been within feet, <laughs> probably 10, 10 feet of one out in the middle of the woods when I was in the White Mountains. Um, and that one Bigfoot came up to me in the dark and I thought it was my friend. Um, he could have had me, you know, and I know I survived that. He didn't, you know, I didn't, there was no grunting, no growling, nothing like that. But that just means he wasn't one of them. He wasn't one of those that would, that would do that. Um, uh, you, you could go into a bad neighborhood in, you know, a, a, an inner city somewhere where there are guys there who will just cut your heart out to get the 10 bucks out of your wallet. You know, you could walk through the, you could walk around the city and I'm from the city. I'm a street kid myself. I'm from Boston. You know, I've been involved when I was a kid. I was in, you know, minor gang fights. I mean, that was a long time ago. Yeah, that was before. That was around the time of the start of the Crips and the Bloods and all that kind of uh, gang fights. But when I was a kid, it was mostly, you know, we went after each other with hockey sticks and bicycle chains and that kind of thing. There were no guns involved. Um, <clears throat> so I'm familiar with that situation. And I knew how I could walk around in neighborhoods like that and pretty much be safe. However... I also knew that, I, and especially in retrospect, that I was pretty stupid for doing that. Because once that situation, once you're in that situation, there is nothing that you can do. And you know that the situation can happen. So to me, it's just, it's stupid. It's like, uh, you know, a kid who, or anybody really, who wants to run across a busy freeway. You know, and he can, he makes it across there a hundred times. He says, oh, I, you know, I can make it across there. I know how to run, run. I know how to get between the cars and I know how to time them and all of that stuff. You know, well, sure. But there's going to be that one time when your timing is going to be a little off and you're, you're a goner, you know, and that is the part that, that terrifies me because we know 
and here, I'll, I'll, I mean, I've talked about the hunters. Let me talk about uh, another situation, another uh, story I heard here recently. I believe this was also, it was either Kumbo or Bear talked about, and it was a different show. Um, they had, whoever it was, talked about how some people had saw, a, they were out in some uh, state forest somewhere, it might have been Yellowstone or something like that, and they saw a Bigfoot walking through the forest with an old woman thrown over his shoulder. A limp old woman. The woman was dead. The Bigfoot was walking off into the woods with this old woman thrown over his shoulder. And that was dinner, you know? So we know that, let's see, they'll go, they'll, they, you know, and uh, a lot of uh, researchers said, well, they're more afraid of us than we are of them. I'm not so sure that's the case. I'm not so sure it's not just, they don't want to bother with us. You know, but then there are some that will. Um, we know that they'll come after us because they want our women. We know that they'll, I mean, it's very um, common for them to come around people's uh, properties, you know, and be walking around in their yard and looking in their windows and, and beating on their houses and making noises and killing their dogs and taking their hogs and taking their chickens and kill, you know, uh, did I say killing their dogs? You know, and uh, <clears throat> Barry even talked about a story when he was a kid where the Bigfoot were coming in and raping their horses and cows. Now, <clears throat> I don't know about you, but if I'm out in the woods and, uh, you know, I'm I, I, a cougar comes up on me and say I'm out there with my girlfriend, you know, and, or, or my granddaughter. I'm not, the, the last thing on my mind it, you know, when I run into a cougar, is is this cougar going to kill me and and kill us and eat us, or is it going to drag my granddaughter off and rape her and then kill her? Because that's what that bigfoot did to that girl on the hood of that car. It killed the boy, and then raped the girl. Now this is, a, is assuming that you take the story at face value, the way that Bear related it. Because personally, I would like to get some more details about that. Because I can see how there might have been some other, another scenario there. But taking it at face value, that it's the Bigfoot. You know, the Bigfoot killed the girl. And then, or killed the guy. Raped the girl. And then ripped her open. Now, I assume it ripped her open because it, wanted to, it took her liver out and ate her liver. Which is what they do to deer. The alternative is that, I don't know, maybe she was lousy and he killed her because she wasn't good. Uh, if you get my drift, I'm trying to keep this PG here. You know, uh, why else would he kill her? He either killed her because there was something he, wa he wanted to eat or liver or whatever, or he killed her because she made him angry while they were, while he was trying to uh, get his groove on. You know, so that in itself tells you you're not dealing with an animal. Because this thing was after gratification. You know, like I said, when, when you run across a cougar, you're not worried that the cougar is going to rape you before it kills you. Cougars don't do that. You know, a cougar doesn't, a cougar doesn't grab a, a deer and say, well, I think I'll rape it first and then kill it. That just doesn't happen. You know, that's that, the only place that you find that thinking as far as I know, it doesn't even exist in chimpanzees and gorillas. You know, I mean, they might amongst themselves do something like that, but you're you're not gonna you're not gonna hear about anything any creature on this planet raping another creature except for humans. You know, and that's instant gratification. I mean, with animals, it's it's not rape. They, I mean, that's part of the, how it works with that. Oh, well, I guess it could be, because usually in most species, the female has to submit to the male and that kind of thing. So, um, I know with with chickens, it, it appears. I mean, I don't know exactly what the sign is that the female chicken is submitting to the rooster. But um, when I was on Granny's farm, it looked a lot to me like the rooster was just having his way with whichever one he wanted. So I guess in that situation, maybe, but, um, by and large, there's, there's a ritual that, that 
animals go through when, when it comes time to do that kind of thing. And uh, <clears throat> when I was in the sixth grade, we took a very basic zoology course at Harvard. And uh, we learned that, um, okay, I had to go back and listen to that. I, I lost my train of thought. When I was at that uh, course in Harvard, we learned that, and at the time, what they taught us was that they're the only animal on the planet that has sex for pleasure is humans. That all other animals, it's uh, an instinct to reproduce. And usually that instinct is caused by the mating ritual and pheromones and that kind of thing. You know, like dogs, female dog goes into heat, male dogs come around and that's what gets them going and that, and that kind of thing. Now, I would kind of argue that. I mean, I remember my grandmother's dog. Every time it would have, it, it had this ritual where it would eat dinner and then go in and it had its favorite blanket that it used to get its groove on with. So, I, I mean, I, I I wonder about that myself. But in the since then, it has come out that evidently all primates will have sex for the purposes of pleasure, not just for reproducing. And it has nothing to do with, uh, has, uh, it's not specifically only during, you know, the female being in heat and that kind of thing. So, but by and large, you're not, you're not going to run into a predator, a bear, a grizzly bear, a black bear, a, pan, uh, a panther out in the, out in the woods. That's, that's going to rape another species. You know, they'll, they're going to stay within their own species. Um, yeah, Bigfoot. And I think that we know that they're, they're raping horses. We know that they're raping cows and they're coming after, I mean, it's really Bigfoot bestiality. I mean, that's what we call it when humans have sex with animals other than other humans. It's bestiality. And the only other species on the planet that participates in that is humans. So that is just another nail in the coffin as far as I'm concerned about these things not just being a simple animal. You know, so <clears throat> we know that they'll come after us for, for we, they're not afraid of us. They, they'll come to our property, they'll beat on the houses, they, they'll, they'll you know, kill the guy to go after the woman because, for gratification. They'll, they'll um, if they, they're, uh, if they find, see the opportunity to snatch up a child or an old person for, for dinner, they'll do that. Um, they'll go after groups of people, you know, the, the hunters out, out there at the, the camp. Um, <clears throat> if you just tick them off because your engine is loud. I mean, uh, Bear was talking about, I think it was Bear, talking about a story uh, where this guy had... Um, when he was out running his bush hog at night, a Bigfoot got mad and the guy disappeared and was never seen again. And, uh, I guess it was Bear himself was out mowing his yard one day and, or a couple of days. And both times this Bigfoot was out there screaming at him. And, uh, so he decided he wasn't going to do that anymore. So a Bigfoot's going to come after you because you're mowing your lawn at night and he doesn't like the noise. So if you're a noisy neighbor, Bigfoot's going to kill you. If you have, if you have uh, a hot woman, Bigfoot's going to kill you and take your woman. Um, if, if you have daughters that are of age, he's going to come over there and try to get, get to your daughters. Uh, this, to me, is not the, the uh, actions of a dumb animal. These are the actions of... Uh, the, the best way I can... The, the, what, what it reminds me of, and what it reminded me of when I, looked, when I saw that one looking in the window was when, when I was 10 years old, there was a kid who lived downstairs from us. And I, I'm not going to say his name, uh, but he, 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 was, he was autistic. And when he would get mad, and he would get mad, it was irrational, some of the things he would get mad about. But he would pick up these massive rocks. I mean, he was like, he would have this like super strength when he would get angry. And he would throw these rocks at us and stuff. And, you know, I was, I was able to calm him down most of the time. So anytime he'd get like that, the kids would come and get me to try and talk him down. And uh, <clears throat> that's what this Bigfoot reminded me of. It reminded me of the mentality of about a five-year-old autistic kid. 
And, you know, uh, Bear also talked about how, um, like, he's, he's known them to be out in the woods and he's looking at them through a thermal uh, camera. And he can see it out there. And the thing's hiding behind a tree. And he, he's saying uh, that they're, they're, they don't realize that we can't see them at night because they still hide behind trees. And then later in the story, he talks about, I think it was the same story. He talks about uh, how if you want them to come close, you have to look away from them. And then they'll slowly make their way up to you until they get very close to you. And that's how you, that's the best way to uh, see them, to have an experience with them and that kind of thing. I don't think they're hiding behind trees because they think they can see, that we can see them. I don't think they care if we can see them. Well, I shouldn't say that. I mean, I, I think that the most majority of the time, well, I don't even know what I'm trying to say here. When, when I saw the one looking in the window and it looked at me, it stood perfect as still as it could. I mean, I could still tell that it was, it was moving almost imperceptibly. Um, but it was as if it thought if it was still, I wouldn't be able to see it. I don't think that it's, they, that they think we can't see them. I think it's, they're aware that it's difficult to see them. And I think that they know from experience that if they stand still and if they're behind things, that it makes it even more difficult for us to see them, which means because they, they have no idea what we can see and what we can't see, which is what bear was trying to get at that. They have better vision than us and they don't know that, but they know that amongst themselves, that it's hard for them to see each other in this situation. And that's what they do is they act not only themselves, but they probably have, you know, experience with other animals that if they're still, if they're behind uh, trees, that the animals in general won't notice them and that they don't even notice each other. So I, I don't think it's that they think that we, we, uh, we can see them. I think it's just that they want to make sure that it, it's as hard as possible for us to see them. They don't know if we can see it at night or not, but they know that if they do certain things, that the likelihood of us seeing them is much less because that's the way it is for them. That's what my theory is on that. So I'm off on a tangent again, and the show is running long. I think I'll make this a two-parter. Um, but the, the bottom line is, uh, I mean, I'll go on. I, I mean, I could go on about this stuff for a long time because there's a whole lot of aspects, a whole lot of things I've heard over the years about Bigfoot's, what they're doing, how they're acting, the stories people are telling that I think are just more evidence that um, these things are not just dumb animals. I think they're self-aware. I think that they are sentient. Um, which is, takes them above the animal kingdom. It puts them in the ballpark with us. And I think that makes them more dangerous. And I may or may not make this a, a, a two-parter. Um, I'm going to have to listen to the show and see if, just how badly I got off track and how badly I didn't make my point. Um, I hope that y'all got something out of it. If you didn't, if, 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 uh, you want to hear more or if you, something I didn't quite nail down good enough you know go ahead and uh, comment and uh I'll, I'll go ahead and do a part two to the show but uh and it, that's pretty much uh at least some of the reasons that it terrifies me to run into one of these and why i mean i may do go out there and do research i'm actually thinking about it but it still terrifies me the idea of running across one um not any Bigfoot, but the wrong Bigfoot, I guess, is the problem. Uh, and you never know when that's going to happen. But, uh, or the wrong group of Bigfoot, too. So, anyway, uh, I'll go ahead and close out the show now. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the show. And if you have a story that you want to tell me, go ahead and email me at Sasquatch Hypotheses. That's uh, ES um, at gmail.com. And uh, I'd be more than happy to have you on the show. 
And until the next show, y'all take care. Back from the dead.